Um, hello again. Good afternoon to those of you joining us from the East Coast or from Ontario. Um, and good morning to all of you joining us from the prairies or the West Coast. Uh, welcome to Civic Innovation Showcase. My name is Marzi. Um, I'm the Program Coordinator of Civic Hall Toronto and along with my colleagues, um, I'll be hosting this session. Um, before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, we ask you to keep your mic muted during the presentation. Um, however, throughout the session, you can share your thoughts or your questions in the chat box. We're actively monitoring the chat. Um, please note this session is being recorded. If you feel comfortable, please keep your camera on. Um, this helps us to get as close as possible to an in-person experience. Um, also, in case you have any tech issues, as I mentioned, you can send a private message to my colleagues, John or Kevin, and we would be happy to help you troubleshoot. Um, along with Civic Hall Toronto and Code for Canada's anti-oppression practices, we always start our event um, with a land acknowledgement. We're joining each other today virtually from across Canada. However, I acknowledge that this event has been organized centrally from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Petun, Mississaugas of the Credit, and Rwandwindat. And it's been home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, if you don't know what Indigenous land you currently live in, I highly encourage you to go to this website, native land ca and find out. Um, we have a very packed agenda today. Um, we have a lot to learn from one another and a lot to celebrate. Um, today's event begins with an introduction of Civic Hall Toronto. Um, our wonderful program manager, Marisa Bernstein, and we'll walk you through our program pillars, how we support the public sector in digital transformation, um, and how we interact with the rest of civic tech community. Uh, one of the main components of Civic Hall Toronto is collaboration and project support. So next, we'll pass the mic to our first guest from Municipal Licensing and Standards at City of Toronto um, to share their collaboration experience and tell us about their project. Uh, after that, we have a quick five-minute Q&A. Um, then we invite uh, another team from the City of Toronto, Big Data Innovation, to this virtual stage to tell us about their project, MOVE, uh, which I believe was just launched yesterday. It's hot off the press, and we're so excited to hear more about it. Um, if you're looking for a proof that government innovation is possible and it's successful, uh, even during a pandemic, I should tell you that you're about to witness digital transformation in action. Um, right after move, Ample Labs is up. Uh, they're demoing their fantastic AI chatbot, Chalmers, um, Chalmers helps folks facing homelessness to navigate resources in the city. Um, 2020 was a great year for Chalmers. Um, they launched in six major cities, I believe, across Ontario. So big shout out to Amper Labs. Uh, last but not least, we have Safe Support Chat. Um, Safe Support Chat team will tell us the story of creating a secure encrypted chat, um, chat function that aims to support individuals uh, with sexual assault lived experience. Safe Support Chat also launched very recently, and I can't wait to hear more. Um, after Civic Tech presentations, we're going to have a 15-minute Q&A for all three Civic Tech um, teams. Um, however, you don't have to wait until the Q&A. You can share your questions and your um, thoughts during the presentation in the chat box. We're actively monitoring the chat, and we'll do our best to cover as many questions as we can. So without further ado, um, I pass the mic to our program manager, Marisa Bernstein, to briefly introduce Code for Canada, especially for those of you um, joining us for the first time, and also tell us about Civic Hall Toronto. So over to you, Marisa. Thanks, Marzi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Civic Innovation Showcase to celebrate this year's Civic Tech Stories. As Marzi said, I'm Marissa Bernstein and I'm the manager of Civic Hall Toronto. So Civic Hall Toronto is a program of Code for Canada in partnership with the City of Toronto, the Centre for Social Innovation and the original Civic Hall out of New York City. 
Just to give you a little background on Code for Canada, we are a national civic tech nonprofit that launched in 2017. So we join a number of Code Fours uh, from all over the world, Code for America, Australia, Japan, Pakistan, uh, you name it. So we aim to build digital capacity in government and civic capacity in the tech and design sectors. And the way we do that is through the programs that we run, which enable governments to deliver better digital public services and empower communities to solve civic challenges using tech and design. So our core programs are our fellowship, education, Grit Toronto, and Civic Hall Toronto. Before we dive in, you know, I just want to acknowledge that this year has been like no other for most of us. And I'm so impressed by the amazing work that government, nonprofits and the private sector have been able to accomplish and, and humbled by the opportunity to collaborate with some of you over the last year. It's really been an honor. And to me, the crisis speaks to the importance of civic tech now more than ever and its capacity to have very real impacts on the lives of residents. And while vital civic tech work has continued, there are certainly inequity gaps that have been highlighted and deepened by the pandemic. Governments have accelerated their response, but it's, it's going to take an ecosystem, a truly holistic, all hands on deck kind of approach. So with this in mind, you know, the purpose of this event today is to showcase the great things that happened this year in civic tech, despite all of the crushing challenges. We celebrate, we reflect on what we can do better, and we learn what roles we can play in improving people's lives. At Civic Hall Toronto, this is the part that we can play. So Civic Hall is a membership-based program. We connect government innovators with tech and design practitioners, entrepreneurs, and residents, and empower them to collaboratively address civic challenges. So we'll show you how that works in just a bit. The three pillars of Civic Hall are learn, connect, and collaborate. So the first is learn. Our now virtual workshops offer foundational learning to teams who seek to build their internal capacity in a multitude of digital transformation topics like these listed here. And we know how public sector can work, ver can, work can vary widely from other sectors with a whole host of guidelines to stick to. So we make sure our workshops are designed and delivered by experts who have extensive experience, either as public servants themselves or working closely with teams in government. You know, because we recognize that, for example, it's not just agile, it's agile in government. And these days it's more like agile in government in a pandemic. The second pillar is connect. So Civic Hall is a place, air quotes, uh, to connect to peers, find commonalities, dish out advice, share challenges and wins, and get inspired to do the work. We used to do this stuff in person pre-pandemic in our space in downtown Toronto, and it was so great to see teams who have rarely connected with each other, meet each other, talk shop over an early morning coffee, and I really miss that a lot. So one of the things we're looking at for the new year is iterating on how we can sort of replicate this virtually. The third pillar is collaborate. At Civic Hall, collaboration is truly at the heart of everything we do. So one of the most valuable things about being a Civic Hall member is the ability to work with an expert from outside of government who brings a new perspective and working methods to your project. Essentially, we learn about your challenges and needs and hook you up with an amazing practitioner from the tech and design sector to get the work done. And you get to learn new tools and techniques in the process. So we're gonna see this in action in just a few minutes. So what's next for Civic Hall Toronto? Well, among many other things, the pandemic has revealed not just lots of challenges, but also opportunities in how we can help public servants across the country build their digital capacity. Because you know, we recognize that digital transformation challenges are felt by public servants in every town and city. Okay, let's move on to the good stuff. So first up is a really great cross-sectoral collaboration that took place this year with a former Civic Hall Toronto member. So it goes without saying that affordable, equitable housing is an urgent issues for cities and towns of all sizes. Rent SafeTO is an initiative from the Municipal Licensing and Standards Division at the City of Toronto seeking to address this issue. It's the city's bylaw enforcement program that ensures that owners of apartment buildings with three or more stories and 10 or more units comply with building maintenance standards. The goals of Rent SafeTO is to ensure that tenants live in safe, well-maintained buildings. So to boil it down, based on recommendations by MLS, Municipal Licensing and Standards, staff, and direction from City Council, the plan was to create an online rating system that displays the rating or score for each rental building. 
But the really big challenge with these things is recognizing that this rating system is public facing and is meant to serve everyday Torontonians for an extremely important and sensitive issue like housing. So how was MLS going to be managing this? How could they be ensure, how could they be sure, sorry, that they're providing a great digital experience for residents? And, you know, as far as digital experience goes, the solution that we at Civic Hall devised for MLS was two prompt. One was to work with a designer who understands and employs human-centered design. And the second is to test prototypes with the people who would actually use the Rent Safe TO rating system and understand their unique experiences of being a tenant right now in Toronto. So why these two prongs? You know, it was important to us to not just to connect a municipal team with a great practitioner, but also to supplement that work with user-centered research and testing so we can ensure that what gets designed and built will work for everyone. Side note <laughs> that we happen to have this research and testing service in-house. It's called GRIT. I mentioned it a bit earlier, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. So the first step in this collaboration was getting everyone in the room to kick off the project and nail down objectives. Here are a couple of folks from MLS with the UX designer who comes from the private sector. So as part of the kickoff, the designer ran a really great workshop with MLS to understand their needs at a more granular level and collect insights about the users and stakeholders of this online rating system. So this took place really just a week before the March lockdown. So thankfully, we were able to have this opportunity to connect everyone in person. Here's another action shot. And I never thought I'd say this, but I actually kind of missed post-its. <laughs> Um, okay, and here are some of the screens that were designed by the UX designer. So after iterating on a couple of different versions of the Rent Safe TO online rating system with MLS, it was time to test them with real tenants. And that's where GRIT came in. So GRIT was able to assemble a diverse group of Torontonians who currently live in Rent Safe TO buildings all over the city. So their feedback on this prototype was super crucial in helping MLS better understand, you know, why people would use the rating system in the first place and if the proposed system would meet their needs. So we recently interviewed two people responsible for the success of this project. We have Jordan Thurgood, a, a senior policy and research officer at MLS, and the collaborator on this project, Lisanne Binhammer, a senior UX designer from the private sector, to talk to us about the experience of collaborating on this important project and what they learned. We should have time for a quick Q&A with Jordan and Lisanne afterwards. So bear with me while I change my settings here on WebEx to play this video. Alrighty then, gonna press play and let's hope it plays. Thank you both so much for joining us today. This project is such a great example of cross-sectoral collaboration and you managed to make it happen during the early months of a pandemic, no less. Uh, so Jordan, I'd like to start with you. If you could boil it down, what was the value for you and your team in being able to collaborate with a UX designer from a different sector? Sure. Thanks, Marissa. Um, having someone like Lisanne with an expertise and focus on UX design was so helpful for this particular project. Um, I think the city is thinking a lot about the user experience, the customer experience, uh, and how to make our online tools mo most accessible. Um, but especially for this, this project working on the Red Safe TO file, you know, we work with these big policies and bylaws that aren't necessarily the most uh, easy to understand for people. And the city has a role to play in making sure that that information is communicated um, as effectively and clearly and as accessible as possible. And so we collect really great data through the Rent Safe TO program that we want to share. Um, right now it's available on our open data portal, which is great, but it's a downloadable CSV file on Excel that isn't very easy to use. Um, and so being able to work with Lisanne on how to make this data most usable to the end user, which in this case is tenants and prospective tenants and residents in the city, um, that was really, really beneficial for us. That's great. And Lisanne, I'm also wondering, as a design practitioner from the private sector, what was the value for you or what motivated you to want to work on this project? 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've always seen so much value in just working with the public sector. I think a lot of UX practitioners really want to use their skills for good, but the jobs for that might be far and few between. So when I had the opportunity to collaborate on this project, I just, I think I was just motivated to use my abilities to um, create something beneficial for Torontonians. That's awesome. Um, Jordan, if you hadn't collaborated with Lisan on these prototypes, what would you have done instead? How would you have gone about completing this work? Yeah, so the rating system and the online tool that, that we've been developing, um, the intention of that for city council was interested in seeing a rating system for apartment buildings very similar to the Dine Safe program that Toronto uses for eating establishments. Um, Toronto Public Health rates restaurants green, yellow, and red as well. Um, and so we probably would have taken that same approach and, and replicated what they have online. But I think we mentioned this in our staff report as well that apartment buildings are different than restaurants and the end user for this tool might be different as well. And so being able to pull that aside and look at it separately um, and work with the plan to, to focus that on the end user um, as a completely different project, I think that that's that was a better approach. That's great. Um, I'd love to start from both of you. What were some of the and challenges in collaborating on this project? Lisanne, why don't you go first? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you kind of touched on this, but it, it's interesting that the project happened kind of pre pandemic and then also during the pandemic. Right? So at the outset of the project, we had some great sessions where we were able to collaborate in person and those sessions really informed my design work. And so, obviously, like many of us are experiencing with the pandemic, that sense of closeness is kind of missing sometimes. Um, but. I'm, I'm just really glad that we were able to overcome it and, and the project has been a success. And uh, Jordan, over to you. What were some of the learnings and challenges on your side? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic has been a huge challenge for everyone, for governments and businesses and families. And um, I was blown away by how the rest of the world kind of came to a screeching halt and this team was able to just very smoothly move forward. Um, I'm sure it wasn't easy, um, but from, from my perspective, it seemed very smooth um, and we were able to kind of to move forward with this. I would have loved to be in one of the in-person uh, training set or uh, testing sessions that GRIT does, but it felt very natural to do it online, given that it's an online tool, people were working through it um, as they would in real time. And so I think it, wor it worked really well. Yeah, that's a really good point. So we only have time for one more question. Uh, Jordan, what advice would you have for other civic hall members or municipal teams in general who are about to embark on this on this journey and collaborate with folks from outside of government? Um, I think to, to jump in and keep an open mind um, and, and think about the long term as well. For us, uh, in the initial stages, kind of identifying um, some potential options, there were some limitations for us. Uh, a big one is kind of on the tech side. We have outdated systems and Lucian had some really great ideas that we might not be able to do right now. Um, but as we're modernizing our systems, being able to take that rather than a barrier as an opportunity um, and kind of use that as kind of the end goal. What can we do in the future and modernize our systems um, to to make that happen over the long term. Great. And Lisa, and similarly, what would you say to other tech and design practitioners who want to put skills to use for good um, and work with public servants? What should they be considering? Yeah, if, I mean, if you have the opportunity to work with the public sector, I would definitely say go for it. Um, I learned a lot, perhaps more than working with the private sector. Um, and that's essentially because there's so many more considerations at play. Um, your design is going to, you know, impact a larger number of people and really resonate with their everyday lives. That's awesome. So that's all the time we have. Thank you both so much. Uh, now we're going to turn it over to the audience for any questions that they might have. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen here. And we have Lisanne and Jordan here to answer any questions. Um, are there any questions in the chat box that I that I can ask? Um, not yet. I don't see any question right now, but maybe wait a little bit. Uh, maybe folks are typing down their questions. Oh, so uh, we have a question in the chat box um, from Arissa from Ample Labs. So 
Um, what was one of the most important questions you asked to residents when doing UX research? Um, well, I, I can take this since I actually <laughs> facilitated some of those sessions. Um, and then sure, Dan, maybe you could jump in. Um, I, I, I think from, from my perspective in asking questions, it was really getting to the heart of every, um, realizing that every tenant ha in Toronto has their own experience, their own lived experience and their own background and special circumstances that they bring to, 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 to this. And so it was really trying to understand um, a, a lot of their entire tenant history here um, from how they first you know, found um, a, a place to live in an apartment building, a rental, um, to how it was dealing with, um, you know, different infractions like like pest um, pest uh, infestations in buildings or or, or other things um, maintenance wise. So that was that was really really interesting to tie their experience to um, to their feedback on these prototypes. Um, Jordan, do you want to jump in with anything there? Sure, I can jump in and maybe Lisanne has some thoughts from the UX design perspective as well, but working on this from a policy perspective, it was great to just hear thoughts on the overall program that we were working on um, and thoughts on this new idea of a rating system. It's something that we had consulted on uh, prior to the pandemic um, and we got some really great feedback, but we weren't sure if maybe public opinion had changed during the pandemic and things were changing very quickly all around them and so maybe Think people felt differently. Um, so kind of having that check in with tenants um, you know, kind of partway through the pandemic to, to see where they were at and what they thought of this system. Um, and it, it was a really good, I think, check in for us to, to incorporate as we continue to move forward on the policy proposal. That's, that's awesome. Um, Lisa, Lisa Ann, are you, are you there? Yes, I if, am here. If you, yeah. wanted, <laughs> if you wanted to jump in with, with anything. Um, no, just that um, it was a really um, just overall the sort of UX research process was really interesting in that I, as like a single practitioner, got to collaborate with Grit, who actually ran the testing session. So there was this really nice back and forth with, you know, what I thought the um, the goals or the questions should be for those um, UX interviews and kind of ideas that Marissa and team would bring to the table as well. Awesome. Um, it looks like we have some more questions. Um, I'm just looking for, so from Andrew, uh, UX research can be a bit of an extractive exercise. So what considerations did you have in the UX research in lessening the, the research burden on residents? Um, that's a multi-part question. Let's, let's do that one first. So that's over to you, Lisanne. Yeah, I mean, I guess I think that's um, that's a really good question to think about the research burden um, being placed on residents. Um, I think that um, the subject matter at hand is kind of a delicate one in that it's dealing with where people live and sort of their lived experiences um, in perhaps not the most safe conditions. So I think that, you know, creating an interview space that's kind of welcoming and inclusive is really important, but also um, mobile designs that are familiar, if you are familiar with the city of Toronto's kind of branding guidelines. So kind of trying to meet users where they are um, in creating that research experience. That's awesome. And and maybe the second part of Andrew's question over to Jordan, um, what process is in place to maintain and perhaps change elements of Rent Safe to you? Yeah, that's a good question. It's something that the program is fairly new and we're trying to make iterative changes kind of as we go along. Um, just as a quick update, we did go to the planning and housing committee yesterday with um, this proposal uh, and we'll be moving forward to city council next week. If it's approved, we'll move forward uh, and start making changes. And I think as part of that, building this new rating system, the online component of the rating system and making changes down the line, we wanna make sure that tenants are continuously uh, consulted and landlords as well um, as we regulate them through this program to make sure that they are brought into the process and kind of brought along to give their advice on uh, what suits them best um, and what is most beneficial for them as we continue to, to improve the program. That's awesome. And and perhaps um, we can put a link in this chat box here to the report that you submitted yesterday to the um, presented uh, to the planning and housing committee and that will be going to council next week. 
Um, what timing? Okay, great. I think that's all the time uh, we have. Um, so bear with we, me, excuse me, while I get my bearings here. Um, I know there are some questions that we didn't get to in, in the chat box. I, I apologize for that. Perhaps we can ask them at the Q&A at, at the very end. Um, okay, so. Okay, now it is time. Um, thanks so much, Jordan and Lisanne, for sharing your collaboration experience with us. Um, it was really fruit, um, fruitful to see um, how, it, sorry, it was really inspiring to see how fruitful your collaboration was. Um, and I'm super excited to see how how, how the, the initiative evolves. Uh, so next we're gonna hear about three fantastic civic tech projects uh, from the public and nonprofit sectors. We'll hear all three and then we'll have time for the Q&A at the end. So you can leave uh, questions in the chat box anytime and we'll try our best to surface them during, during the Q&A. So first up, I'd like to introduce another team from the city of Toronto, uh, Big Data Innovation. Uh, as mentioned earlier, they officially just launched their product move yesterday. So obviously a lot of exciting things going on yesterday here in Toronto. Um, we have Akash and Shine from their team who are here to talk to us about move. So over to you, Shine. Awesome. Uh, can everyone hear me? Good to go. Cool. Uh, thanks so much. We're really excited to be here. Um, it's been great having a long-term engagement with Code for Canada throughout this project. So really excited to share uh, what we've learned here in front of all of you. So uh, Shani, you want to just move over to the next slide? Great. So there's us in our pre-pandemic clean shaven glory. Uh, my name is Akash. I am the team lead for the Big Data Innovation Team within Transportation Services at the City of Toronto. Uh, Sean, you're on mute. Hello. Can everyone hear me? You're good. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Sorry about that. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sean Chaudhary. I'm the design lead at MOVE. And uh, yeah, so we're here to provide a bit of a window into our recent and ongoing experience developing digital products in government. So I'll, I'll provide some quick background first. Um, the, the primary driver for this project has been the city's Vision Zero plan. So we're taking actions with the goal of eliminating collisions that result in people being killed or seriously injured on our streets. And this plan, this vision ties into essentially all of our programs. Uh, there are two data sets that are foundational to this work. So number one, we have collision data. Uh, so that's any recorded event in which a vehicle is involved in a collision, whether there's an injury or not. And two, uh, traffic count data. So we have uh, a massive counting program in which we count cars, pedestrians, cyclists at a number of locations across the city on a rotating basis. And so until now, um, the division has relied on crash and flow, as you can see on the screen. Um, so these are systems that were built over 30 years ago, and they're responsible for managing all of our collision and count data. And one of the major pain points here is that these two data sets, which are fundamental to a lot of our analyses, are managed in different systems. So to get these things on the same map, there's sort of these tedious manual steps in order to do that. Uh, and quite frankly, these systems don't meet the needs of, of our division anymore. So not only were they built on old tech, but we've changed a lot since the 90s, especially with our renewed approach to road safety through Vision Zero. So we needed not just uh, a new software, but a rethink of the entire ecosystem around this data. And so uh, we've been working in collaboration with Code for Canada since 2018 to develop MOVE. Uh, a new digital platform for traffic collision and volume data. And Shine's going to peel back the curtain a bit to discuss how we built MOVE. Hey, everyone. I'm super excited to be here today. I want to start off by talking about our approach. MOVE is inherently people-centric. 
there are numerous teams within the transportation services that use the product in unique ways. To get a better idea of those unique ways, we've taken time to understand users' needs, their wants, their fears, their motivations, their behaviors. Users are at the center of product throughout the entire product development process. In fact, we involve users from the very beginning. Our user-centric design process de-risks the entire product development process as users are familiar with the end product because they engage with it while it is being developed. So what does that look like? Well, I mentioned the word process a couple times. Uh, here's a quick look into ours at Move. We start by conducting research and to understand more about the users. Um, then we work towards synthesizing our learnings and defined needs. Afterwards, we really emphasize on ideating through various levels of design fidelity, times with users themselves to further validate our research. Afterwards, we spend time to prototype our designs and test them out with users. Testing is extremely important with us, and what we do is we collect and analyze feedback uh, from users regularly. Possibly go into more research. As you can tell, this is you know, this enables us to constantly iterate on the product itself. Now, in October 2019, I had an idea of how to do research, and then COVID-19 hit and we had to fundamentally change how we work. Here are some of the tools that we now use at Move on a regular basis. An important thing to note is that each of these tools are web-based, so they're web tools. That means they work on any computer with an internet connection and are therefore easily accessible. You know, we previously used to visit our users in person to conduct usability testing sessions. Now we use video conferencing tools such as WebEx. While it's difficult to not be physically in a space with our users, I really miss that. Uh, but one benefit with tools like WebEx that we notice is that you know, we can now see users and their expressions as they're interacting with the product in real time. This gives us another data point and seeing users' faces just light up when they're interacting with a move or show confusion uh, is extremely valuable. What you're seeing right here in front of you is a design on Figma, one of the tools that we use here at Move. And uh, this has been great. I am super excited to actually see Move in action. So I'm gonna hand it off to Akash so we can get into the demo. Akash? Awesome. Thanks, Shine. Uh, so we're going to actually just jump to the actual thing. Uh, we've talked a bit about it. Uh, cool. Okay. So here is Move. Um, we, as as uh, uh, Marissa mentioned at the front, we actually just launched this thing uh, yesterday to all of our users within transportation services. Uh, I'm not going to be able to dive in too deep because we only have a couple of minutes here, but uh, one of the major pain points I mentioned early on is that we didn't have access to collision and volume data on the same map. Well, we do now, and that uh, is going to fundamentally change a lot of the processes that a number of our users uh, follow on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's dive into one of these intersections. Um, let's let's go to King and Bay at the in the heart of the financial district. So we're just going to type in King and Bay. You get a drop-down list, and we're at the intersection. So as you can see, we have uh, these blue dots, these large blue dots on the map. Uh, those represent um, locations where we've done traffic studies in the past. Uh, and then we have a number of red dots, which represent, uh, each rep red dot represents a collision event that's taken place over the last, last 10 years. Uh, if we're more interested in more recent data, uh, we can change that dropdown from 10 to three years. As you can see, some of the red dots disappear. Um, if we're interested in some of the uh, traffic study data that came about from this uh, intersection, we can hit the view data button and this pulls up some pretty detailed data. Oh, sorry. This summarizes the number of collisions that have taken place historically, 476. Uh, we can also see that there's been seven, uh, what we call turning movement counts. So how vehicles move through the intersection. Um, so we have seven of those and we can actually hit the view reports button and check out some detailed data uh, on how those vehicles are navigating the intersection. Uh, but we're gonna go back one screen and um, 
as you can see, we can actually, we're not going to dive into this here, but we can actually request new data through this tool as well. And that would be filtered through our data collection team here at the city. Uh, and then one other feature that's sort of been a recent addition, um, if we're not interested in just what's happening at this one intersection, but along an entire corridor, uh, we can actually add a location. So say I'm a transportation planner and I'm interested in what's going on on King Street between Bay and Jarvis, I can hit the add location button, um, type in King and Jarvis to pull up the second intersection. Uh, maybe we can turn off some of the layers. And yeah, we can see that now both of those points are on the map. And if we're interested in anything between those two points, we can just hit that checkbox. And now we have data um, at our fingertips for all the intersections between those two locations. So I think we'll end the demo there. Uh, Shiner, if you're just able to jump back to the slide deck. Great. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, we actually just launched Move 1.0 yesterday. It's a huge milestone for us, and we're going to start to onboard internal teams over the coming weeks. And uh, I'm going to steal a line from our product manager, Matty. So we've earned our place at the start line, and now continue. Uh, now we get to continue to build on top of this foundation. So uh, I'm sure others on the product team will would agree that. Um, this has been quite the journey, and it's been really rewarding to end up with a product that we all believe is going to be uh, pretty transformational in the hands of our users. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Um, I'm going to say you cannot answer questions right now. <laughs> oh, sorry. Gonna... <laughs> That's okay. We, uh, we, we, <laughs> we're going to do them at the end after we hear from the other team. So, um, <laughs> but other than that. Thank you so much, Akash. That was awesome. And, and Shine, that was so great. Um, just super impressive what, what, what you all have, have built over the last uh, year or so. Um, okay, and now we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, so we have Arissa from Ample Labs here. Ample Labs is a Toronto-based nonprofit that is committed to helping residents who are experiencing homelessness to navigate essential resources. So things like housing, food, health services across the city. So Arissa, I will pass the mic to you. Hey, yeah, thank you. And if anyone has any questions for for Akash and Shine in the meantime, sorry, just put in the, the in the chat box. Yeah, congratulations on your launch, uh, Move Team. We're really excited to see what's next for you guys. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slide deck. So if you give me one quick second. Connecting. There we go. And is everyone able to see my screen? I get a verbal yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm on a different screen, so I can't tell. Yes, we can yes. see your yep. screen. You're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, awesome. Hey, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Arissa, and I am happy to be here representing Ample Labs today, along with our CXO, Jordy, who introduced himself in the chat. Thanks for that, Jordy. Um, and we are really excited to be here and talk about our product. Before I get into that, I really want to say a big shout out and thank you to Marcy and her entire team uh, for putting this together and giving us the platform to speak, as well as to all the participants um, and everyone attending for facilitating a space where we can learn from each other. I learned so much from the last presentation and I'm really excited to keep learning from you guys. So jumping right into things here, uh, who is Ample Labs and what do we do? Well, Ample Labs is a tech-based nonprofit and we work to empower those of us facing homelessness using technology. I say those of us because we actually have a lot of people on our team um, that have lived experiences with homelessness, uh, a big core value of ours is human-centered design. And so all of our products are built really closely in partnership with um, our end users and folks that we are uh, hoping to address. Our vision is a world where nobody has to face homelessness, and that is a pretty bold vision. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the macro and micro challenges that we've identified, as well as some of the ways we think we can contribute to the solution. So at a macro level. When we think of homelessness, we generally tend to think of folks who are on the street or folks who are facing chronic illness. Um, now, the reality of the situation is that that only makes up about 10% of the population that's facing homelessness. The other 90% are folks facing transitional or invisible homelessness. So that could be, for instance, 
people who are facing job loss or eviction, or really anyone in a precarious situation that is falling in and out of homelessness. And another fact that we know at a macro level is that Canada is spending close to $33 billion yearly on homelessness. And a lot of that has um, previously been allocated to uh, resources for the chronically homeless. So let's dive a little bit deeper now. Um, we're seeing that hidden homelessness, this demographic that's constantly overlooked, is actually rising at quite a high rate. As we can see here, it actually recently surpassed the rate of uh, folks facing chronic homelessness, and it's pretty much higher than uh, in a lot of cities, uh, the general population in terms of growth rate. So that begs the question of how can we intervene when folks are facing hidden homelessness to ensure that they don't fall further down that funnel uh, towards chronic homelessness? And what kind of resources can we as a society invest in uh, that have longer term impact? And that brings us to the prevention-focused response. A lot of folks in the audience might already be familiar with this model, internally referred to as the Gates model, uh, presented by our friend Stephen Gates at the Homelessness Hub. And it does a really good job of describing how we've traditionally and in the past really invested quite a bit in emergency response. Although, um, as we learn a little bit more about homelessness and as there's more research on the field, we're seeing that the impact is really in prevention and accommodation supports. So. Now that we have a recap of the issues of homelessness on a macro and micro scale, what exactly are we trying to do here at Ample Labs? Um, so a quick overview, our team, our, um, our leadership team is actually all tech-based. They all come from tech backgrounds. So when they were presented with this problem, it was like, okay, well, what is the most accessible way to get a mass scale of people resources that they need? Um, and what comes to top of mind generally is technology. So they looked into it a little bit further and they found that in North America, 90% or 94% rather of people that are experiencing homelessness own a mobile phone and 77% of them own a smartphone. However, it still takes up to 48 hours to find a critical resource and it's a really stressful um, and overwhelming process. So they started to think, okay, well, how can we make this not only simpler and easier, but also a more friendly process? And that's when Chalmers Suite comes in. So Chalmers Suite is a combination of two of our flagship products, Chalmers, which I'll be doing a quick live demo of right now, and then Chalmers Enterprise, which I'll show a quick video on. So let's move right to it with respect to time. One quick second. And is everyone still able to see my screen? Sorry, verbal. Yes, yes. you can see. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so everyone, I'm excited to introduce you to our friend Chalmers. Chalmers is an AI chatbot that helps those of us facing homelessness access critical resources in a matter of seconds. So as we can see here, there's crisis, food, things to do, clothing, and shelter as the primary resources it can connect us to. So for today's demo, let's go ahead and say we're looking for shelter. May I use your location? So Chalmers asks that to essentially find the most accessible resource to us. I can say no for today and just provide like the closest intersection. So let's go ahead and say the CN Tower in downtown Toronto. Correct. So that is my location, Chalmers. You've got that correct. And now Chalmers is letting me know the closest shelter to me when it is open who is eligible, and how I can get more information. So as we can see here with eligibility, it's everyone between 16 and 29. I fall within that demographic, but for whatever reason, if I didn't, I can choose my age and gender options, tweak that, um, and find something I'm more comfortable with. I can also reserve a bed, find another time or option, or hit directions, which will take me right to Google Maps, um, where I can find my way there. So this is a really quick example of finding a critical resource, but what if I'm looking for something a little bit more longer term? Luckily, Chalmers can help us with that too. Uh, so something we see often is folks aging out of foster care and then not really knowing where to go from there. So if I say I am out of foster care, help. Let's see what Chalmers can do for us. Well, there's a lot of support available to me. Um, I'm looking for financial support here. I am over the age of 18. And boom, Chalmers has presented me with a solution to my problem um, in a matter of seconds and shown me what I am eligible for. Now this is all really great, but my favorite part of Chalmers is how empathetic and uh, how much of a friend Chalmers is. So because this is a really stressful situation to be in, if I say something like I'm anxious or I'm facing depression, which we've seen a lot, in fact, suicide hotlines and usage have gone up by like a thousand percent during COVID-19, Chalmers will express empathy, say things like, I'm here for you, um, I'm here for you, friend, and then uh, would you like to speak to someone? So if I go ahead and say yes, it'll connect me the appropriate resources uh, to help me with my mental health. So these are just some of the awesome functions of Chalmers as a friend. Of course, it is accessible in other languages. Um, uh
things at home as well, like domestic violence. So it is an overarching tool um, and a friend that we can use. Uh, and it's not just for folks facing homelessness. A lot of our users are actually people who are friends and family. We have a lot of frontline workers, about 178 police officers in Barrie alone using our application, hospital workers, etc. So this is a really great way to connect people to those resources. But that's just one side of the coin. You might be thinking as municipality, policymakers, how can we leverage the data and how can we leverage what people are telling us and what people need to create systems that actually work for them? Well, that's where Tomer's Enterprise comes in. I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that I can share the video really quickly um, and we'll take it from there. Just one sec. Introducing Chalmers Enterprise, a powerful enterprise app for cities and government to get real-time data on service use in order to inform decision-making and resourcing. You can log into Chalmers Enterprise based on your credentials. Chalmers Enterprise has data that allows you to see in real-time how many new clients have entered into the system. You can see the entire user journey of who is successful in finding and using services. Over time, we can show the outcomes of those who use the services. Who's exiting homelessness and entering into permanent housing? How many days, weeks, or months have they stayed in the system? How many evictions have been prevented? How long on average does it take for those who exit homelessness to do so? With Chal oh, sorry. Chalmers Enterprise, you can get an overview of demographic data of those searching for free services by age, ethnicity, and gender. The heat map is another dashboard that gives you a holistic view of service demand by geography. Imagine being able to see in real time which services are requested and in which neighborhood right down to the postal code. You can use this data to inform resource allocation by geography. Besides location, you can also see exactly when services are being requested most. Chalmers Enterprise will show you what the other needs are requested by users. You'll be able to see what gaps there are in service availability and time. And through this data, you'll be able to increase the impact of services just by changing the times of existing programming. With Chalmers Enterprise, you can get a holistic view of demand by time, location, and demographics, allowing you to make database decisions on when and where to have new programming. Awesome. Well, that was a little bit about Chalmers Enterprise. And as mentioned before, uh, Chalmers app is the flip side of that same coin um, that's uh, demonstrating to the user side uh, access to critical resources. I'm just going to really quickly flip back to my slideshow for my last Two minutes, please. Perfect. Great. So, as mentioned, Chalmers is a suite. So, it is uh, now in 50% of Ontario as of the end of this year. And um, in 2021, we're hoping to move across Canada as well as into the United States, starting with San Francisco. So, just a quick plug here if you are interested in learning more about Chalmers or how to bring Chalmers to your city in 2021, um, I'd love to chat more. And I know I've been doing a lot of the talking today. So, I'm actually going to put a quick survey right into the chat as I pass the mic back to Marzi and team. Um, but thank you so much for your attention and uh, thank you for having us today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Arissa. That was that was so great. Um, just beyond impressive. Uh, we've been fans of Ample Labs for a long time and are just so excited to see how you guys have expanded your services to, to tons of communities in need. Thank you so much. Um, so last but not least, our final presenter is the Safe Support Chat team. So Safe Support Chat is a safe, encrypted chat service that helps individuals who have experienced sexual assault. Safe Support Chat is another inspiring story. So Kim, Sharon, Brent, and Louisa from their team are all here with us. So over to you all. Great, thank you. Um, thank you to Marcy and the team at Civic Hall Toronto for giving us the opportunity to show you an online tool that has been developed specifically for the Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers. Uh, Safe Support Chat, which is uh, part of a larger innovation fund project funded by the uh, Ministry of Community and Social Services Office of Women's Issues, has been built by many people um, and uh, also uh, included is this co uh, collaborative core team of Primal Global Communications, Nomadic Labs and Brent Edwards Consulting. 
Because of the four years that we have had on this project, we've had an access to a significant amount of user information which had, was gathered through sexual assault center consultations and a nine-month pilot using off-the-shelf uh, chat tool. We became very aware that uh, during this time that w the two end users of an online chat tool had very different requirements. So the support seeker from the research uh, that was conducted, we understood that those who were looking for support or information about sexual violence online wanted to connect through a tool that would feel familiar and secure and would allow them to decide whether they shared their identity or not. When we de uh, de developed the persona for the support seeker, we recognized that anyone uh, connected uh, to the cool tool could have experienced uh, sexual violence. And so we wanted to focus on the behaviors of someone who would be seeking support around sexual violence. And uh, through the uh, work with sexual assault centers, uh, the centers, we knew that the centers were looking for uh, a service to provide uh, a safe and secure uh, that protected the support seekers identity and allowed the centers to manage their own services independently from each other. And with the persona of the support worker, uh, it's based on user research that was gathered from crisis support workers who have worked or volunteered at sexual assault centers. So we went through the tech, skills, mental state, the needs and the pain points for those support workers. Yeah, so I'll talk a bit about how we responded to those needs and requirements. Um, we developed a chat service called Safe Support Chat and the service is actually made up of a couple different components. So first of all, there's the embeddable chat box. So this is something that the sexual assault support centers can embed directly on their website. And it looks a lot like other chat tools, so it should feel pretty intuitive to the support seekers. And then we also built an SMS bridge. So this allows support seekers to connect to the same chat service through SMS. Um, so they don't need internet and it's something that they're already familiar with. On the support worker side, we're using a lightly customized version of a tool. It's an open source tool called Element and it's developed by Matrix. And so this lets support workers access their chats from web and SMS all in one place. And lastly, we created an admin page for the uh, centers to manage their own chat service. So for example, they can customize the messaging, they can enable or disable features like chat transcripts, and they can set the schedule for their services. So demo time, we're gonna look at what the support seekers and support workers actually see. Great, so Sharon's going to pull that up. So on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, the chat platform for the online facilitator, and on the right side is the uh, safe support chat where someone would access the support. They would click on the support, uh, start the chat, a box opens and ask them to uh, look at the terms of use for that center and ask if they would like to continue. Once the support seeker decides, yes, we want to continue, a chat request is, uh, is sent to the online facilitator to let them know that someone would like to uh, connect with them. Meanwhile, the support seeker is also being told that someone is going to join the chat. You can see that Amelia has accepted the chat and has now joined it uh, on the side of the support seeker. You can also see that Amelia is typing and it's real time and that the support, support seeker can see that Amelia is typing there. The support seeker then responds back to Amelia in real time, can use uh, emojis. We found that during the pilot, um, those who were seeking support were very comfortable using emojis uh, during that time. And you can see I, we're doing real-time messaging here, which was a, a really important feature for the support. And, and you can also see that there's a lot going on on the Safe Support chat uh, backend to ensure that there's end-to-end -end encryption and that somebody is coming in anonymously.
If somebody has to leave the chat or if they want to hide the chat, first they do is they click to hide the chat. It, it drops the uh, chat down, but the chat is still there. They can open up the chat and continue um, once they want to do that. If they need to completely close off the service, they can click on the uh, upper right X and the chat is completely gone. The history is gone and the online facilitator can see that the person has left the conversation as well. So then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the SMS texting bridge that we've made. Um, as you can see, the uh, texting feature is uh, similar to every texting feature that uh, is out there. Um, for each center, uh, Sharon mentioned that the centers can customize uh, their services. Messages are customized through the admin page. And so each of these messages would be um, as the sexual assault center would like it to, uh, to respond to. Then you can see on the right hand side, the platform is exactly the same for the online facilitator. And so to be able to manage uh, multiple chats or texting uh, chats, it's a very easy uh, online service to use. You can also see that the anonymous uh, person who's coming in anonymously, whether it's SMS or chat, uh, with the the on the chat platform side, you can see that we've indicated that it's an SMS uh, chat uh, connection, which is important for the online facilitator to know because we do communicate differently through SMS uh, other than what we do uh, on a chat box. So it's important for our, the online facilitator to know that. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Again, so just to to sort of wrap up and and continue on with what Karen, Jim, Sharon, and Kim were saying, um, what we have here is our key features: is that that end-to-end -end encryption. And I can't stress that enough. Um, every message from the chat box all the way down to when the support secret sees it is encrypted uh, on the server and it's never stored in plain text. Um, we have no tracking at all. Um, once once a support seeker leaves the chat, they are they are out, um, and uh, we don't keep any record of that. Um, the service is configurable. Um, they showed we showed the SMS bridge and the admin page. Um, the SMS bridge is something that could be added, um, and then the scalability and, and extensibility. Um, so that's things. Uh, there are many more add-ons that uh, could be added to this, like uh, WhatsApp. Um, video chat straight through it if uh, if that becomes a possibility. Um, of course, it needs to be accessible. And the other really key feature is that each of these is a self-contained installation. So each center um, that we install this for gets their own uh, server spun up. Every bit of their service is on that same server um, and not shared with any other center. So um, all their data is controlled within one place. Um, putting this together um, was a huge collaborative effort. Um, it's come through many uh, different events. Um, I joined on in the Random Hacks of Kindness uh, step. And uh, I'd also like to mention that Random Hacks of Kindness did uh, donate to us for a year of uh, Google Cloud platform servers, um, which was great. But um, yeah, our project team is uh, Primal Glow, uh, myself, Nomadic Labs, and we've been working together since uh, late last year, uh, really getting going on this. And it's been really great uh, working together and seeing this all come together. And from here, um, if you want to visit safesupport.chat, uh, if you have any questions, um, they may be answered there. Otherwise, uh, post some questions in the chat. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sharon, Kim, and Brent. That was that was amazing. That was fantastic. Um, what, what a great um, product that you've built and really such a vital role you're playing in, in helping people when they need it most. Um, so if, if you could all uh, join me just, you know, in a, in a huge virtual congrats clap for all of our presenters <laughs> today. Um, I'm just blown away by what you've all accomplished. Um, and, you know, during, during the pandemic, no less. Um, it's amazing how this super important work has, has, has continued. And that's just, just made us major kudos to you and your teams. 
Um, okay, so it looks like we have about 11-ish minutes for, for Q&A um, with, with all of our teams. So if our teams that presented um, can unmute themselves. Um, I'm gonna, I'm just going through the, we've had so many questions. Um, actually, one of the questions I saw kind of asked a few different ways a bunch of times in the chat was, was for Ample Labs for Arissa, and it was around the sort of um, data privacy kind of thing. So um, like striking the balance between gathering gathering data and, and informing product direction um, versus like protecting the privacy of your users. That was a great question by Maddie. Um, if you could just speak to like how, how you handle um, um, privacy and data management. Yeah, great question. I think I'm actually going to let uh, Jordy take this one. He is our CXO and super knowledgeable on this stuff. So I'll uh, pass it over to him. Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. Um, as Arissa said, my name is Jordy. I'm the Chief Experience Officer for Ample Labs. So things like data uh, user experience are, are really my kind of major areas of focus. Um, and I also am a user experience researcher by training. So the data kind of lives in separate pockets. Um, and so we were very intentional when we were building our product around PIDs and how data is to be shared. Um, so one of the first ones is we actually do have a research repository, um, which has extremely controlled access to who has access to user data. And so the actual user information and like the video or audio content are, are actually basically separated out. Um, so that only a small group of people have access to that actual information. Um, we do our volunteer run, um, but we actually do have volunteer agreements. We have our volunteers actually sign agreements to do with confidentiality. Um, and then when in terms of our analytics data, we actually do separate out the data. So we have API data that's actually stored. And so, you know, for example, it has questions like onboarding about what's bringing you there. Um, and then we also have like location data and we actually keep the data intentionally separated so that we're not able to, you know, use a program and see exactly all the person's responses to something, to a question, where they're located, and the services they're looking for. So all of those things are kind of kept in separate areas. So we might have information in terms of our chatbot. It's kept in a separate area. We have information about location. It's kept in a separate area. All of these things are secured. Security is highly managed. And then we have information in terms of what they're kind of like, for example, like some general information of what they're looking for. So all of those things are actually kept separately and we do not mix those data that make data together. So we do not actually triangulate the data and we make sure the data does not actually speak to each other. The other area is also around something that we've done with the chatbot itself. So if you use the chatbot, it just goes to Chalmers. So this is something that we, we also looked at doing. So for example, if someone's looking for like women's crisis lines, and then someone were to pick up their phone and open up their history, all it shows is Chalmers. It doesn't actually show any kind of detailed data beyond that. And so the, the big thing is, is it is a balance. You know, I mean, we look at, you know, how companies, you know, and, you know, you know, out there use data and, and how they kind of, you know, huge thing is triangulation and that allows you to have a deeper understanding but it comes you know, at, at a cost to people's privacy and autonomy. Uh, and, and the key thing that we're doing with Chalmers is, is really making sure that we're serving a vulnerable population, you know, have user research, we engage in conversations about not only you know, what we are understanding about our data privacy, but having actual engaged conversations with the user about what they perceive and they want out of their data privacy as well. That's awesome. Thanks, Jordy, for such a great answer. Um, also wondering where we can get these um, really cool Ample Labs orange toques. <laughs> um, they're just awesome. And now I think I definitely want one and I'm sure other people would too. <laughs> um, okay. To, oh, on the website. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we have a question for the MOVE team. So I want to get to at least a question for each team. Um, so a question for, Sh for Shine and Akash um, around your, the tool set that, that you use. Um, so curious about how you decided on the tool set other than the obvious need to collaborate, you know, like why Figma over XD or Envision? And did you face any issues with procurement processes which, which can slow down the acquisition of necessary um, and often, you know, novel tools in the public sector? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, 
Figma over XD or... Shine, can you do me a favor and just um, you sh shout a bit more? Okay, all right. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yeah, this is great, sorry. This is great, 2020 right here. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna start talking about Figma uh, uh, first. Now, we decided to go with Figma for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is that while it's true that all of these web tools enable collaboration, uh, Figma is really some real-time collaboration. As you can see, your uh, colleagues and uh, other users using Figma along with you, you can see their cursor uh, and you can see what they're focused on at that point in time. It's also a place where you can uh, use like developer handoffs, so we don't have to use a separate application for that. So it's a lot easier to work with uh, the, the, you know, your developer and the, just the general product team altogether. It's also a place where you can put comments. Now we don't have to focus on, okay, like where are we gonna handle- We can't hear you. And people hear me. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to come a bit closer. How about now? Okay, okay, great, all right. Um, so mainly Figma has uh, a more robust real-time communication and real-time collaboration features that are different than XD and Envision and it's web-based. I, you know, that means it's like platform agnost, uh, agnostic. So I can use a Mac or a you know, Windows uh, computer and I can still use Figma. I can easily pass along a Figma file to people on a Windows PC. It doesn't matter as long as they have an internet connection, they can use that. Um, working with developers is extremely easy through Figma as well. And uh, when it comes to the other tools, uh, what we had to do was, you know, a, a lot of, trial and error uh, when it came to using Whimsical and Miro. We, we tried to uh, do some of our research processes on that and collaborate via, you know, uh, on, on Miro. And what we learned is that each tool has uh, a strong set that uh, is, is great depending on what stage of the design process we're in right at, at that point in time. But all in all, we kind of uh, solidified on these tools that they worked for everyone in our team. Um, in regards to the procurement process, I'm gonna hand that over to Kosh. I think you're on mute, Akash. Um, you're still, there we go. Yep, okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so real introduction of so any your Yeah, for sure. That that gets that gets a bit more tricky. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks so much for your response to that. We have a um, question for the safe support chat team. So you mentioned that you're using open source tools for this project. How are you using those? Uh, how are you using the data? I think uh, Sharon and do you want to? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, how are we using open source? So I'm not sure about that last part you tacked on about data, um, but I can talk about what type of open source tools we're using. So the chat box is using React, and it's also, the, the, but like really the main thing that we're using is Matrix. So this is the communication, like the decentralized communication protocol that um, Element is built on. And so we're basically using um, that entire communication system to power our chat tool. And, uh, and yeah, and we are also hoping to make um, like the chat box itself and the bot that kind of organizes everything behind the scenes and the SNS bridge also open source. So we're working on that, um, but mainly um, building off of matrix is, is the main thing. 
And can I just mention that doing that has allowed us to create a tool with not a lot of financial resources to this. We got funding for the the tool, but we needed to find creative ways to to build it. And Matrix has been very interested in this uh, chat uh, service that we're building and have offered uh, beyond uh, using it to uh, to give us advice from their foundation. So it's been amazing. That that that's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for for the your answers to those questions. Um, I think that's about all the time we have for questions, and there are so many other ones that were so great. Um, I'm wondering if the presenters can put their contact information in, in the box, and if we could, you know, send send um, try to send you those questions, or if anyone has questions they want to direct to you, um, that that would be that would be great if you can do that. Um, so I'm just going to go back to sharing my screen for a moment here. Okay. my computer is hungry for lunch. Um, yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's we're at time, unfortunately. I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining us for our Civic Innovation Showcase. And thank you, huge, huge thanks to our presenters. Um, so impressed with the work you, you've been doing, you can continue to do, just phenomenal. Um, if you have any questions about Civic Call Toronto, please reach out to me at marissa at code4.ca. Um, on behalf of Civic Call Toronto and Code for Canada, uh, Marzi and I wish you all a safe and healthy holiday season and look forward to continuing to work with you in the new year. Thank you.